Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the uh, February 9th, uh, 2022 Board of Education um, meeting to order. Uh, meeting has been uh, properly posted. Could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Mr. Alexandrovich? Here. Mrs. Sapersky? Here. Dr. Kahn? Here. Dr. Baer? Here. Mr. Sprague? Here. And Mrs. Witkowski? Here. We are all present. Thank you. We all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item number three, I'm looking for uh, a motion to approve the uh, agenda. So moved. Second. And motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item four, Friends of Franklin. First Crohn's, uh, Ms. Sapersky, uh, Ms. Byshog, and uh, Mr. Schultz, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, and um, Mr. Persky, um, 
Uh, now we're talking about the life change uh, pharmacy. Um, Ms. Call and Ms. O'Neill, please. Thank you. Our community comment, participants under this agenda item must be residents <laughs> of the Franklin Public School District or parents, guardians of Franklin Public School District students. Must state for the record their full name and address and must <laughs> limit their statements to three minutes with a maximum of 15 minutes for any and all comment. If the community comment is related to an agenda item, the board may respond to that comment either at the end of the community comment session or during the discussion of that agenda item. The board may not discuss a comment or question that does not relate to an agenda item per board policy administrative rules 8300. Uh, Tom Lutka, please. Tom Lutka, 4201 West Central in Franklin. I have three grandchildren in the, in the school district, two at the middle school, one in the uh, grade school. Uh, so I'm, I'm here on myself, but also my son who's deaf, he, he obviously can't come and talk to you right now. So, but those are his children. Well, when the pandemic started, we obviously uh, had rational fear. We didn't know how long it was gonna last, who it's gonna affect, but I have to commend the board because within six months you realize it's barely affecting children and you had the school district reopen by that September where a lot of our neighboring school districts were not. So I congratulate you on that. We had an episode in January. We went to the sixth grade um, concert at the middle at the high school. The middle school concert was at the high school. I can tell you, 85, 90 percent of the people there were not masked, but all those poor kids on the stage were masked. And you obviously can't do much of a concert when you're trying to, trying to sing through a mask, and some of the songs were in a foreign language. And you can imagine if you're deaf, and even if you can sign, you got to see lips, you got to see faces, and that was. That was a non sequitur. So uh, I know what the policy is, and what I'm here to say is you need to change that policy. Put it on an agenda item, uh, make it optional for uh, uh, parents. If they want their kids masked, fine, let them mask them. There is enough data out there now that tells you the effectiveness of masks, which is almost nil. I bet most of you, if I run into you in Walmart or uh, Sendex, you're not wearing a mask. Okay, we've, we've moved from doing rational things to irrational things. So these same kids eat lunch together, they take the masks off. They see each other after school, they go to each other's birthday parties, their masks are off. So uh, I know you're not gonna deal with it tonight, but I would encourage you that as soon as you can, revisit this, and before you vote on it, educate yourself. Don't believe me, and I don't, just don't believe everybody walks in here and tells you how great it is. The data is here, the charts are here, the uh, two years of study is here. So do me a favor and do that before you take another vote, but it's time to change that policy. Your neighboring districts don't have it, there's some states that don't have it, there's countries that never did it, and they're no worse off than we were. So we have to stop inculcating irrational fear in children. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you.
Adam Wittenberg, please. Hello, Adam Wittenberg, and I'm going to continue on with the same thing I've been talking about this whole time, because uh, the last school board meeting was a joke. The medical team presented us information that really gave us nothing about keeping these masks on our kids. Um, and it became very clear that the four of you who voted to keep the masks on our kids really have shown no intention on doing your own research and really digging in to find out what these masks are. Thousands of doctors around the world um, are against them. It's, it's out there. It's been out there this entire time. The effects that these masks are having on our kids is unacceptable. It is delaying their learning, decreasing their um, ability to see you know, other faces, the facial expressions, mouth movements. For the kids who have a speech delay, it is imperative for them to be able to see lips and see people talking for them to develop their language and continue speaking. I have a child in that exact situation. Now it's awesome and great that majority of the kids aren't wearing masks right now. Super cool, but there's still kids, the youngest ones are still forced to wear a mask. It's complete idiocracy. I've spent a lot of time, um, I knew nothing about masks. So I've spent a lot of time researching, listening to both sides, I don't watch the media because the media hasn't been for the people in decades. I've spent the time and researched and listened to both sides of the argument. And in 2022, there's absolutely no reason for our kids to be in mass. None. Um, and I'm going to continue coming here every board meeting until this is dropped because I want to make sure that the four of you have zero excuses when this is done that you can't say you haven't heard from other parents, you haven't heard that there's research data out there to go off there. There's no excuse, there's no cop out, there's no playing a victim card. This is on your hands of what you're doing to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that conclu uh, concludes community comment, but um, since the um, life, uh, life Change Pharmacy uh, people are here, um, could we please have the nurses come up again and, <laughs> and recognize the... Take two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, item six, uh, consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. School board announcements. Any announcements by school board members? Yeah, I just wanted to announce, especially for some of our regular attendees, we are going to be starting our practice of having two school board members here 30 minutes before the onset of 
the meeting um, to talk directly with members of the community if they so desire. So um, we'll try and publicize that in our various outlets, but feel free to spread, spread the word. So 30 minutes before the uh, regular meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, school board calendar, there's a regular board of education meeting Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022 at the ECC at six. Also um, a regular board of education meeting Wednesday, March 9th at the ECC at six. Uh, item nine, uh, update from the district administrator. Dr. Miller, please. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Um, well, we're working our way through February, and um, we're actually looking forward to next Monday and spending Valentine's Day with our students. It's always a special day in the schools. Um, I'm pleased to share with you that our Franklin Educational Foundation has again put together their Valentine fundraiser, and hopefully you've had a chance to participate in that. Parent volunteers will be putting together over 900 Valentines for distribution this coming Monday to the district and the staff. Um, Ms. Vicki Corgani is here in the audience this evening. I'm not sure if she'd like to add anything else to that. Um, it's been a pretty exciting fundraising campaign. Yes, um, I would say uh, we were very lucky to um, have Educator Credit Union reach out to us and offer a $6,500 grant towards the foundation in return for gifting every single staff member with Valentine this year. Um, so that's been a, a great wonderful uh, example of some community support for our staff and teachers. Um, as well, we've had a really good out tur turnout of parents and staff uh, for Valentine's. So our uh, committee is extremely busy right now. Um, yeah. We're putting together thousands of pieces of chocolate and cocoa and cookies, lots of baking. So uh, Monday should be pretty busy, but it's a, it's a good problem to have right now. <laughs> so it's good. Thank you so much for that. Um, this week marks the 100th day of school. And if you have a child in elementary school, you'll be reminded of that. Um, they have a lot of fun activities to commemorate that, and you should see some things on social media about that. Um, I'm pleased to share with you that our COVID test center with Summit Labs has been um, really continuing to run very successfully. Um, the numbers of testing have gone down um, in the last week, but we continue to offer testing currently from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the high school and here at the ECC. Um, our K-12 music program um, is working through a, a, a review of their curriculum um, at the elementary, middle, and high school. And um, what they've done more recently is establish their ideal state for the future of our music program. Their next step is to brainstorm some action steps to move us towards that ideal state. Another area of the curriculum that we've been focused on is our Ed for Employment plan. We're working on two important goals this year, which include continuing our work around the profile of a graduate. What does a graduate of Franklin High School look like? And um, we're also working to develop our teacher career pathway. Um, we want very much to promote um, education among our students and teaching as a, as a career choice. Finally, I'd like to announce that tickets are now on sale on our website for our high school spring mu musical, Matilda. Everybody's getting really excited about that. It takes place on April 7th through the 10th at our Sabre Center. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, item 10, reports, presentations, and other school board business. WADA service recognition. Mr. Hine, please. <clears throat> I think we'll be fine if okay. you're out here. Jim, would, would you agree or what would you I prefer? Think. Yeah, uh -huh. just turn the mic towards you and you can stand back there. That would be fine. Yeah, your voice projects pretty well, yes. Jordan. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Hine, and I have the privilege of serving as the Athletics and Activities Director at Franklin High School. Tonight, I am very proud to recognize our school nurses, Molly Call and Lori O'Neill, for their unwavering commitment to the students at FPS and specifically tonight, recognizing them for their commitment and their teamwork over the last 22 months to keep our students and our coaches and our staff involved in athletics and activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Wisconsin Athletic Directors Association, or WADA, composed of over 500 athletics and activities director, or athletics and activities administrators across the state of Wisconsin, 
sponsors the Wisconsin Athletic Service Award. This award recognizes individuals who have demonstrated outstanding commitment and or service to the development and conservation of interscholastic athletics and activities. The award strives to highlight the individuals or teams behind the teams, those who are working tireless, tirelessly to ensure that our students involved in athletics and activities have opportunities for engagement, for achievement, and for positive experiences. Since the pandemic began, Franklin High School and the Franklin community has had many moments of pride in how our students involved in athletics and activities have performed in competition, in the classroom, and in our community. Without doubt, our students and families involved in athletics and activities have demonstrated perseverance and poise despite the continued adversity surrounding the pandemic. All while battling adverse health conditions and constantly changing federal, state, and local guidelines, our teams, clubs, and activities found success again and again. With nine high school teams qualifying for their respective team state tournaments in the last 12 months. Numerous individual state qualifiers, multiple individual state championships, and several team state championships during the last 12 months. In addition, our students involved in clubs and activities have found success on the stage and in competition, such as our top three at state forensics team last year and our theater productions. Over the last 22 months, our student engagement in athletics and activities at the high school continues to rise despite the COVID-19 pandemic and despite the conditions we need to operate within. Now more than ever, athletics and activities are an important piece of the high school experience. Our students involved in athletics and activities are our most public and highest achieving representatives of our district and community values. Our nurses, our coaches, and our advisors have trusted our process and successfully led our young adults through the most adverse health and social events of our lifetimes. I share a brief recap. Pardon me, I might, it's, it's been a long 22 months. And they're, they're wonderful teammates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> all right, I, got this. <laughs> I share a brief recap of our public success because I think it's important for everyone that's witnessing uh, the meeting here tonight and those that might watch it on public record later to understand that behind every win and achievement that is public, there's a team of incredible humans. Uh, incredible humans working tirelessly behind the scenes and well in advance of events to make sure that our path to success is accessible, safe, and sustainable. Beginning all the way back in April of 2020 and continuing through today, Molly and Lori have been outstanding teammates in ensuring that our students have access to these important opportunities. We've come a long way from May of 2020 when we were starting to plan how to safely bring our students back to practices, weight training, the smallest little things of gathering uh, to get our students back on campus over the summer of 2020. We would not have the accolades we have today without the teamwork and leadership and collaboration of Molly and Lori. They continue to bet on us to trust that we will follow the process and we will make progress and we will use data to guide our decisions and to continue to help us progress and move us more towards normal. I don't think in my time of working with them uh, during the pandemic, I don't think they've ever said no. It's always been, how can we do this in a way that supports our goals of keeping our students in our classrooms while also allowing our students to engage in the activities, the events, the opportunities that mean so much to them. We are blessed to have school nurses that truly understand how important these opportunities are for our students, our staff, and our community. I cannot accurately express my own personal gratitude for their ability to problem solve and provide support for our students and their colleagues during some of the most difficult situations. They've always put first the mental and physical health of our students and school community. Our two nurses have spent countless hours around the clock working to keep our coaches and our families informed and confident in the plan. These two teammates have handled our most difficult and frustrated parent and staff conversations with grace and their perseverance to continue moving forward inspires me to do the same. For every conference, regional, and state championship our teams have earned, Molly and Lori are proud members of those teams. 
When my wife watches this later, she's going to be <laughs> <laughs> She's either crying with me or she's going to be laughing. Either one. Oh, okay. Molly and Lori are proud team members of all those teams as they have been instrumental in making sure we had a process and a plan and an on-ramp so that our students can be successful. For their continued service and commitment to the Athletics and Activities Department at Franklin Public Schools, I am very proud to present the Wisconsin Athletic Service Award to my friends and colleagues, Molly Call and Lori O'Neill. Thank you very much. Very well said. Uh, item B, 2020-21 financial audit. Mr. Milzer, please try and top that. <laughs> Could we move on to the at-risk report? <laughs> uh, we have the 2020-21 uh, financial audit, which doesn't top that, okay? <laughs> Let's just say that it's a great audit, but it, it doesn't top that at all. Uh, and um, the, our, the managing partner from Riley, Penner, and Benton, uh, Mr. Brian Mechanick, um, will be joining us by phone. I'll call him now, and um, and then he will go over the report like he usually does, and take any questions that you have. He was just out of town, and I didn't want to have this go any longer. Okay. <coughs> well, you sure don't want to empty out the rooms yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can do better. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. Okay. So I I have introduced you. Uh, all right. And the board is all here, and they know that you will be going over the audit. Okay. I'll kind of do like I have done in the past, uh, just a brief overview, and I'll leave time for questions. Um, so with that, I will start. Um, the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with um, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, we had full cooperation of the staff um, during the audit. Um, we'd like to thank them for that. Um, made the audit go very smooth. Um, and then um, then the, the audit report, um, we kind of, um, a summary of the audit, we have the basic financial statements of the audit report. Um, and that is the statement of net positions, and then we have the governmental funds. Um, and then we have required supplementary information, which is budgetary comparison, um, and then schedules that are related to the OPEB um, and the supplemental, um, and then also the total pension liabilities. Um, so our general fund, we had an increase in our fund balance for the year of $1,863,000. Um, the ending fund balance, um, you had non-spendable, um, which is your prepaid of $344,711. Um, restricted of $1,021, um, that's related to the library aid fund that you received that was not, the full amount was not spent. Um, so that changes from year to year. And then we have unassigned of $25,117,000, um, which makes up about 39% of your fund balance. So um, that's at a good place to be. Um, it helps minimize your amount of short-term borrowing if you, or it kind of, you won't have to do any short-term borrowing with that um, amount of fund balance. So that's a good place to be. Um, then we have our general fund budgetary information. Um, we show um, <laughs> expenditures this year. Um, you budget 63795000 
Um, this is for fund 10 and 27, keep in mind. Um, and total actual expenditures were 60 million 532. So you spent 94.89% of your budget, which is um, great. You did not spend the whole amount. Um, for revenues, you budgeted 63 million 795,000, um, same as expenditures. And you received 63 million 930,000. So you received 100.21% of your budget, budget um, revenue, which is great. Um, then we have our debt activity. This year there was proceeds on general obligation bonds of 18 million 590,000. Um, and then we have payments on the GO bonds. So this includes your regular payments plus um, the part of refinancing. That was 24 million 910. Um, so we have total interest for the year of 2 million 239,693. Um, then we have our lovely um, information um, on the report um, for the um, other post employment benefits, the OPEB. Um, so in the report, we show that your annual OPEB uh, stipend um, and, uh, cost was 417,622, um, which was up a little from last year. That was at 430, or down, was 432 a year ago. So um, pretty consistent there. And then contributions made to the plan were, um, so this is for the payments, that was 1,268,000. Um, and those were down from a year ago, that was at 1,459,000. Um, so then we have our net OPEB. Um, we have a um, stipend obligation, um, which is a liability of 6,690,000. Um, we have deferred outflows um, related to the the OPEB of 1,616,000 is X as an asset. And then deferred inflows related to the OPEB of 184,000. Um, so in total, your net liability for your OPEB, um, you're at 5,258,000 from um, for this year compared to 5,937 a year ago. So your liability decreased by 678,000. And part of that is um, just the, the, the when as you pay that out, it's going to go down. And also, they used a discount rate this year, decreased from 3.5 to 2.25 percent. So that has a change in the actuarial calculations as well. Um, then we also have a footnote on your supplemental pension liability. Um, this is we're showing a liability of 9,146,000. Um, deferred outflows of 1,314,000. And deferred inflows of 930,000. So net, we're showing um, a total liability of 8,376,000 uh, um, compared to 8,498,000 a year ago. So that liability went up a little, and obviously that's going to change a little with the benefits that are received um, as premiums go up and so forth. Obviously that'll change. Um, so. Um, that's pretty reasonable to a year ago. And then we have our net pension asset. Um, this is the Wisconsin Retirement System. We have total assets of 12064000 um, We have deferred outflows um, related to the pension of $18,854,000. Um, and then deferred inflows related to the pension of $26,427,000. Um, so your net of this is $4,491,000 as an asset. So. Um, and that uh, increased from a year ago. That's all based on the actuarial calculations that um, the, the Wisconsin Retirement System does um, for all the, the Wisconsin Retirement Systems for all schools. Um, then we also um, have a single audit um, that we do as part of uniform guidance for the federal funds and um, Wisconsin state funds also. Um, I'm happy to report that there were no findings related to either um, of the federal or state single audit. Um, and then we also issue a management letter. Um, here we talk about significance of deficiencies, uh, which we have every year, which is preparation of the financial statements. So the only part of the audit report that is really the auditor's responsibility um, are the three opinion letters. Otherwise, everything else in the audit is responsible of management. So. That means the management should be able to have all the appropriate disclosures and make all the GASB adjustments. Um, and I would say probably 99% of the school districts in the state rely on their auditors to prepare that. So um, with our standards, we're required to do a significant deficiency. So I would not have any concerns with, with that finding. Um, then other, um, we talk about your um, actual requirements for your pension, that next actual report is due July 1st of 2022. 
for the 2023 year. Um, and then we also have a comment in there about GASI 87. Um, that's a new um, standard that's coming out for years and uh, for next year. Um, and that relates to leases. Um, I don't think you guys have any leases that, that would be required to accrue for for GASB adjustments. So, um, but we just want to make sure that you're aware of that because if you do any leases, whether it's financing or operating lease, they will get recorded um, on the books going forward. So, are there any questions? I guess I'll, I'll ask a question. Mrs. Lukowski, please. So all that pension information you gave us, um, the changes, are they more a factor of interest rates or inflation? And are, what can we expect in the future with inflation popping up and interest rates yeah. obviously responding? Um, that's a good question. Um, they do the discount um, rate um, that they use, and that's usually um, for the um, calculation of the benefits. And they actually showed a decrease for this year. Um, and actually in the footnotes, let me just go to one of the pages. I can. can you give so us a on page each reference? one, um, for the um, like, if you look on page 34, this is for the supplemental pension plan. Um, it shows you what happens when your discount rate changes at least by like one percent. Um, so currently, like your total pension liability, you're at, at the 2.25. It's at 9,146. That rate drops a little um, to one another one percent. That increases your um, pension liability by 9,639. So um, with an increase in the discount rate, it um, reduces your liability. So um, you could take a look for each one of those on what 1% discount rate would do. Um, but that's just a pretty much an estimate for that they use for future periods. Um, so it, it's hard to say. Um, that would be a good question for the actuaries um, on how that would change in the future. So it's more of a future concern, not anything immediate. Correct, because a lot of the benefits that you're going to be paying um, for, like, let's say the OPEB or the supplemental, it's pretty much related to health um, insurance. So that would have um, a bigger impact on what the health insurance rates are going to do. So that's kind of why that has changed. And then with the WRS, um, as your, your rates also change, there's, there's um, rates that they use for the investments because those funds are invested. So those will continue to increase as well. We haven't had a change in those contribution rates in a while. Is that correct, Jim? They haven't gone um, they, the WRS, they change those annually. Um, they're, if there were changes, I don't recall. Hold on, I can go there in the footnotes. Um, yeah, they are at 6.75% this year, and I want to say that, that was, there was no change in the prior year um, related to those. Okay, thank you. I have another, uh, and those are set by Wisconsin Retirement System. I have another question I have is um, our fund balance, which is we've contributed to fund balance of over a million dollars over many, many years. What I know, what can we have too much, or what is uh, when does it get to be too much? Um, I would say, um, you're probably at the, the upper end right now. A lot of schools they'll hit be to um, around the 25 to 30 percent, um, because it minimizes their short term borrowing. Um, so you're at 39 now, 39 percent, which has gone up. And I've seen in the last two years with COVID that these have actually gone up a little because expenses are not coming in as like they're receiving the funds, but the expenses, they're not over, they're not spending the full amount because of um, students not being in school and so forth. That was for the prior year mainly, but yeah, because you're, you've kind of grown added to your fund balance the last two years and this year it was 1.86 million. So. Right, and we did make the conscious decision to um, move less to our capital fund because of the uncertainty in funding for schools going into the next biennial budget. Correct. Anybody else have any questions? All right, thank you very much.
All right, thank you. thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. You too. All right, thank you, Mr. Milzer. If I could have one more oh, thing. I, I just noticed that we have um, Michelle Olszewski with us, who is our comptroller, and uh, she is the reason uh, that these auditors uh, have it so good when they come here. <laughs> Everything is just so. It's the way it's supposed to be, and they, they don't have a problem. Everything's waiting for them. Uh, and she has it all figured out and, and running extremely well. So I'd just like to thank her for that. She does an excellent job with it. Thank you. Item C, at risk, re at risk status update. Ms. Cody, Ms. Jewell, and Ms. Athman. Mr. Milzer, are you able to help with our technology? Certainly. Are, are you? Yeah, over there. sorry. Well, good evening. Um, we are here uh, to provide an update for the school board at the request of the board. So this is typically, thank you. Um, this is typically a report that is really provided once a year. And I know when we shared um, the data in the fall, we did note that there was an, a significant increase in the number of students who were identified as at risk. So um, it was really a great request uh, to give us the opportunity to check in with you and share some of the progress that we've made as well as new learning and just the current status um, of our students. So I, in advance of the two of them speaking, I want to thank Anna and, and Steph both for their um, work in this area. They did a lot of groundwork um, initially in the fall as we prepared the first report and then obviously this fall as well. And they're working really on a, a daily and weekly basis with our staff um, to support all of these students. So, all right. <coughs> I'm plugged in. <laughs> sure, now it doesn't work when I don't. I don't know, that's a beautiful presentation. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Did you say you shared it? Uh -huh. I did. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Everyone take a deep breath. All fine. This is the worst problem we have. Yeah. We should be grateful. Yeah, exactly. Let's just think back to Jordan Hines' presentation. <laughs> Was really nice. I hope he saved copies of those remarks to give to them for their. I know. Conference. I wonder if it was any good. It was very <laughs> heartfelt. I call it my warm and fuzzy drawer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. While we're waiting, could um, you remind us of? We talked earlier, um, or earlier this year, obviously, and um, the House of Corrections students are um, added for the first time this year. Is that um, is that something we did? purposely or is that something that is um, mandated by the state? Well, we have not done it in the past and we really should have been reporting out. Um, they are part of our um, school district and they are statutorily at risk. Um, so we will continue to do that moving forward. It's just unique in terms of, again, the length of time that we are able to serve students and um, obviously like access to them is you know it's just a different way of approaching um, their education but they're still we're still responsible have, for have the numbers of students at the HOC gone, has that number gone down 
um, over this past year? I mean, I would expect all most of them to be at risk. Sure. Um, yeah, we have that information actually included in here. So oh, maybe we'll keep rolling, and then if you Thank have you. Um, continued questions, that would be great. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, um, our purpose is to provide an update. So um, you can click on. Thank you. All right, thanks for allowing us to be here tonight. I'm Ann Athman, School Social Worker. So I just wanted to give a brief definition of what at-risk would be, defined by the Wisconsin legislator as students in grades 5 to 12. So the first indicator would be um, if students are dropouts, so not re-enrolling into high school, um, they automatically qualify. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And then if they hit two or more of the following criteria. So one or more years behind their age group in the number of credits, and students can earn up to eight credits a year. Um, two or more years behind their age group and basic skill levels, so we look at the SPIRE and ECT test scores to see where they're at. Um, habitually truant students, so those students who have five or more unexcused absences are considered habitually truant. Um, parents, we do have a few students at the high school who are parents. Um, adjudicated delinquents, so those involved in the court system and then eighth grade students who score in each subject area of the exams um, below the basic skill level, and then those who fail to be promoted to the ninth grade. So um, here you can see our data. Um, so if you look at the last line in the top chart, you can see in the fall, we identified 58 students at being, as being at risk of not graduating, and I believe there were 11 at the HOC um, at that point, um, in addition to the other 58. And then um, now, mid-year, you can see we don't typically recalculate mid-year, so this is a new calculation for us, but we have 46 students at the high school who are currently at risk of not graduating, and 16, 16 students at the House of Correction. Um, so to your point, Mr. Sprague, have the numbers increased or decreased? I would say it's tricky because the overall enrollment in school fluctuates constantly um, based on residents. So the House of Correction being more of a transitional correctional facility means students are in and out quite frequently. We've held steady at about 16 or 17 students for the most part. Um, at the beginning of the year, it was a little bit lower. So. Uh, we haven't we have seen an overall increase now in students who are eligible for school meaning they're still school aged um, at the house of correction and then we're also kind of working through currently there's no 17 year olds there's no students who are mandated to attend school um, housed at the house of correction excuse me, questions they wouldn't ever graduate from I mean, we never had a house of correction student graduate from yes yeah, so we've had one this year we have one okay. yes success yeah. All right. yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so typically um, that kind of process involves us determining what credits they've earned up to that point, and then we determine what they would need to receive a Franklin High School diploma. If there is a student who is kind of out of reach of a diploma within the time that they still are school-aged or within the time they have remaining at the House of Correction, sometimes they'll opt to get a GED rather than a diploma. We help them with that process as well. But uh, so far this year, we have one student who received a Franklin High School diploma. Um, okay, so then you can see the fall co cohort progress in the next um, chart there. So you can kind of see further the breakdown. Um, and so what we did here is we tried to distinguish uh, between the cohort from the fall and now any additional students. So that's kind of the tricky piece of recalculating <coughs> the data mid-year is we had a significant number of students fall off of the at-risk list, and then we did have some students who hopped on um, the at-risk list, which typically we don't see mid-year. Um, so overall, we had a 43% decrease. So uh, from that original cohort of 58, only 33 of those students are still statutorily at risk of not graduating. Um, and you can see the numbers there for uh, which ones have dropped off. And then you can also see in that last chart the <coughs> newly identified students and their grade levels as well. So then here's just more breakdown of that data for those who are no longer at risk. So the 25 of the four, uh, 58 students. So five students that have successfully completed their gradu graduation requirements um, early through the, one of our alternative programs. 
So two students have graduated from the Vision Academy, which is housed inside Franklin High School, and hopefully soon we'll have a few more joining them in the upcoming weeks, which is great news. Monday. Yes. Two, two more Monday. So we had the meeting. Wasn't that great? <laughs> um, and then three students have graduated from Connects Learning Center, which is one of our other alternative placements in Cudahy. Um, so that's great news that those students have obtained their diploma. Um, and then 15 students identified are no longer meet two of the criteria, and most of them has improvements in that attendance, so they are no longer habitually true compared to when they were um, last year, so they don't have five or more unexcused absences. And then four students did not graduate or re-enroll at Franklin High School or any of the alternative programs, so they're no longer being factored. Um, we've given that opportunity to them at the beginning of the year, and they just decided not to continue on with their education, which is unfortunate. Um, and then one student um, moved districts, so we wouldn't consider them at risk through our school district anymore. And then at the continued at risk, the 33 of the 58, um, two students have dropped out or been withdrawn due to absences and are not known to be continuing with school. And then um, we have those newly 13 identified that meet the criteria. Um, so one of our uh, big takeaways is that attendance piece. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. What we're finding very consistently is that the students who are being identified as statutorily at risk for not graduating have the habitual truancy indicator in addition to one of our academic indicators. So either they are currently credit deficient or they are uh, one or more years behind in that basic skill level. So. Uh, there's definitely a tie to those two things if you consider, okay, well, if you are, you know, not meeting an academic indicator and you're not coming to, to school, those things probably mesh together um, quite closely. So we're definitely finding that. And as a result, trying to take steps to ensure we're really working on that attendance piece of how do we ensure that these students are coming to school so that they're not habitually truant. And then as a result, they're not ending up um, behind in their academic um, abilities as well. So then some comprehensive programs and services that we have implemented. Um, each student has an at-risk plan where they identify a goal, um, have interventions and strategies, and then progress monitoring. And we are, as a team, meet with students compared to semesterly. We're meeting with them quarterly, so more frequent checking up on them, um, having parents involved, special education case managers, the whole team involvement to get them engaged in school. Um, and then it's broken down into five different areas. We have student services team members to help out that, supplemental instruction, the alternative programs, um, vocational programs to help them with jobs, and then health and critical issues of those who might have mental health needs or a physical health needs as well. I just a question on the previous slide. What's the difference yeah. between supplemental instruction and alternative programs? Can so, you help me understand that? So alternative programs would be more of those um, general education mm -hmm. students that um, necessarily might not have like an IEP compared to supplemental um, instruction could be those with specifically to assigned instruction where they're getting more support inside school. Okay. Um, compared to general education students might go to a different alternative program that might not necessarily be at the high school. Okay, thank you. And then um, some more supportive strategies. Um, it breaks down kind of the student services support, what we focus on, counseling, crisis intervention, weekly, um, daily check-ins, check-out, transition planning, referrals to outside agencies as well, which is a huge key, huge key piece to that attendance since a lot of times these students have like underlying mental health concerns that are going untreated. So that can also affects their attendance. So by referring to those outside agencies, we can help get those treated and help them get back into school. Um, and then personalized plans, so goal setting, modifying their schedules, attendance, self-monitoring, having that self-awareness piece can help them too, to see where they were and where they're at um, in their goals. And then additional instruction time, so with teachers during goal block, um, individualized education plans, and then our alternative education actions as well. Um, so some of the key actions that we've taken specifically to kind of um, address the situation of having 58 students at risk of not graduating high school, 
Uh, we, as um, Anna mentioned, have increased that frequency of progress monitoring, so really trying to look more quarterly. And to be honest, I meet with every single school counselor um, at the beginning of the year, it's once every three weeks, and then after the semester, it's every other week. Um, specifically focused on seniors, but then through our uh, student services and admin meetings, we also connect on all students. So trying to really make that data and just keeping track of where students are at a part of our continual routine practice. Um, we also have done some work in terms of trying to make sure that we're addressing attendance as part of a student's individualized education plan. It can be very easy to focus academically on how to support students, um, but we've really tried to consider um, Ms. Athman uh, teams with the associate principals and we do our habitual truancy meetings. So now really trying to focus on if there's a student with an IEP um, who is on the habitual truancy list and we're having meetings, how is that really becoming a part of that individualized education plan um, rather than something separate? Like how can we utilize that student's whole team and their plan to make sure we're checking in on the attendance piece as well? Uh, we are looking into providing an additional option for credit recovery um, to try to create something that's not um, like a full-fledged alternative where you're not within a regular FHS schedule, but something where if you're just a credit or two behind, you have an opportunity to um, either in one block of your day make up more credits quickly um, or potentially earn credit outside the school day as well. So we're trying to think of some additional ways to get students that support that they need. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, continued to improve the collaboration and adult practices on behalf of students. So some of that data analysis to really make sure that we're um, trying to team and understand the full picture of why a student might not be on track for graduation. Uh, we've also worked, um, Ms. Cody has helped us with our transition practices and really trying to consider, okay, as a student transitions from uh, fifth grade to sixth grade or then the larger transition of eighth grade to ninth grade and now you're earning credits that put you on track for graduation or not. What does that look like? How are we supporting that transition so that we're not getting students who right now we have few ninth graders but by the end of ninth grade we start to see students hopping onto that at risk list. So how can we make sure that transition is a good one so that they're supported right from the get-go? Um, and then we're trying to uh, address some of the different root causes. So whether it's mental health um, that's causing truancy or maybe AODA issues, um, what's really the root of that truancy and how can we get students to school? And finally, we have, um, in addition to all of the strategies and tactics that um, Ms. Altman and Ms. Jewell mentioned, we are engaging in um, a more formal improvement process so it's the graduation rate improvement plan and we'll be working, um, we'll be working with a representative from CISA 1. She is actually the transition improvement grant coordinator. But um, through this improvement plan, it will take kind of all of these maybe, I don't want to say one-offs, but we're, <coughs> we're working hard to learn about what our students need and what, what's best practice and so by moving towards something that's more formal. Um, we are going to really create a strong foundation and see some systemic changes and improvements um, because we will have um, research-based practices in place. Um, this will give us an opportunity. It's a multi-year commitment. So we'll have a comprehensive team involved in um, doing a data dig and, a, and developing a plan and you know just following through on the you know the plan that we agree to and that comprehensive team will include members of the middle school and high school staff and again through this process we will have access to tools and supports and um, resources additional resources so um, it is a it's quite a commitment but it aligns really well with the direction that we're going with our coherence plan and um, we acknowledge that we need to um, continue to grow and develop to meet the needs of our students with IEPs I forgot to mention this really focuses on students with IEPs but again when we learn best practice here what's good for this group of students will be beneficial for all so that's something we're really excited um, to move forward with as well so any, any questions at this time? I'm just curious, so we, we improved a lot 
the group that we looked at when we came here last fall, but we picked up 13 at the semester break. Is it all truancy too, or is it, what, uh, is there a common the, theme? Or Yep, 10 of the 13, the truancy indicator is one of their two indicators, yep. So a significant number of those additions are students who are not attending as expected. Okay, and to your other point, it's not necessarily, I just don't feel like going to school, but there's a root cause that's deeper than yeah, and that's a large portion of why we have the um, habitual truancy meetings. Um, so students end up on that list, and sometimes it's a simple, like, a parent did not properly report attendance. Um, so it's kind of a process of trying to follow up on why and determine that root cause of, like, why are those absences lingering out there as unexcused? Okay, thank you. Did you have anything to add on? No, you took the words right out of my mouth. That was good. <laughs> Do you think uh, number 13 is maybe because of the pandemic spike and has the pandemic played any role in that or not? Um, it's hard to say <laughs> with any like real certainty. I had some sus suspicions when we had 58 in the fall that a lot of it was, um, you know, not properly reported absences for whatever reason, whether it was a student who on either end of an exclusion didn't come to school because they weren't feeling 100% and the parent just didn't report it because they're like, well, they were excluded from school and that was excused absence. Like, it's kind of hard to, to say with any certainty, but it's something that we think may have an impact. I appreciate the thoroughness of this report and that that it, it, it appears that we're taking a lot of actions to improve mm -hmm. this. Um, and uh, I'm impressed with that the number went from <laughs> 58 to 33, even if it advanced a bit um, with other um, with other students. But I appreciate the work you're doing, um, mm -hmm. looking for outside help from CESA. Um, you know all the all the um, reporting and meetings and and that sort of thing that you're having. And and I think it is, you know, important as we come out of um, of COVID <coughs> to keep this up, um, um, especially um, until it gets to be a a more manageable number probably isn't right, but um, but you know the the numbers were consistently between ten and twenty for ten years, and now mm -hmm. it went up. And and uh, you know, I, I I appreciate that you're that we're doing making great strides to um, to make a dent in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item D, future facilities planning. Dr. Miller and Mr. Milzer, please. I'll let Mr. Milzer get the slide deck ready, but um, just in, in terms of an introduction, um, you know, I've worked in the district a really, really long time, and mm -hmm. the whole time that I've worked here, we've been a growing district, and I've been fortunate enough to see that growth and, and, and um, be a part of that, and it continues, and it's exciting, but um, as a school district, we need to be very aware of what's happening in terms of the developments in uh, this community and be prepared to educate the children that come along with those developments. So most recently, Mr. Sprague and I um, met with the mayor, and he was able to um, give us information about some new developments. Um, it's all, all public information, of course, that they discuss at their common council meetings. But we thought this evening we'd give you kind of a picture of that. We're not coming with a plan. We're just coming with information tonight so that you have a general sense of what's happening. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mr. Milzer to kind of highlight um, those developments for us on our, on our slides. All right. Well, we'll start with the new developments. And... Uh, I'm really going over uh, developments that are either just beginning or are um, in the process of going for approval with the city. So developments that are substantially complete aren't really listed on here. <coughs> this is our uh, school district boundary map. In the top left, uh, right here, in the blue is uh, Whitnell School District. Uh, on the right, the brown here is the Oak Creek School District. And then the colors in the center represent the attendance areas for our elementary schools. 
Uh, Countrydale is in the green there. You can see that it has a very large attendance area and it's been able to have that size of an area because the entire southwest mm -hmm. corner of the city was not developed. And now it's starting to develop um, and they, they wouldn't be able to sustain this at Countrydale for the long term. So that's one of the things we'll, uh, we'll need to look at. We'll start off with the Pleasant View area. Uh, here we have uh, Pleasant View School is uh, in the yellow with a little flag on it. Uh, there's Rawson Avenue coming across 51st coming down right down the middle. And they have a development right along Marquette Avenue now that it's gone through. It's Pleasant View Reserve. It's 53 lots and there are seven homes under construction uh, in there right now. Moving to Countrydale. Um, closer to the south part of their attendance area. <coughs> uh, we have uh, Loomis Road uh, over here, Ryan Road going through the middle. This is 92nd Street, and uh, this is the curve on Highway 100 here, just to get you oriented. Uh, our property, Ryan Road FTS property, that's our new property right there. Uh, number two, is a concept plan that came uh, before the city for 87 lots. It's not come back to the city for approval, uh, but the city didn't really have a problem with it uh, when it, it came. Uh, although that's Newman development and they're also involved in number five on there. So they could be waiting for that to start. Uh, Ryan Meadows is number three that has 79 lots with 12 homes under construction currently. Number four are duplex units. Uh, 26 units, uh, not fully approved yet by the city. And then five is Cape Crossing with 142 lots, not fully approved yet by the city. And the developers had said that they thought that would take four to five years to complete that. Moving to the northern part of the Countrydale attendance area, uh, we have Loomis Road kind of cutting through on a diagonal here. Rawson Avenue at the top, Highway 100 on the left side, local road through the middle there. We have Oaks Estates, which is 16 lots, and there are six homes under construction. Uh, here I've got a chart pulling all this information together. So we have each of our schools on the left-hand side, and then the next column is an estimated number of additional students by school that we would get from all of these developments as well as the what's left of the current developments. Um, for instance, the um, development on 76th and Oakwood, there are some houses left to be developed in there. Those are all part of this as well. Next column is existing enrollment with 4K at 0.5. The 4K program is a half day program. So in this, we're counting them for half. Um, as we're putting it against our building capacity. Then we have enrollment with the existing and the additional students. So our existing students and students that are coming from these developments. We show our building capacity and then the amount over or under building capacity now and the amount over or under building capacity with the existing students and the additional students added. Uh, so what jumps out at you is that Countrydale is uh, short of space for 25 students at the end of all of this development. Uh, another thing uh, that's out there is Ben Franklin has 190 extra seats. So um, we'll be working with the city planning department to look at what their thinking will happen in these areas. But it is possible that we would want to make uh, Ben Franklin's attendance area larger and take some of Countrydale's attendance area in order to balance that out at least in the midterm uh, before building another school. Looking at land, uh, this is our district property. It's outlined in red there. It's 228 acres. Uh, although there is a fair amount of uh, creek and, and wooded land going through there. Uh, we're working with our architects and our civil engineers right now to plan where development would occur on this property. But I would say the most likely scenario 
is that one or two elementaries would be on 92nd Street south of Ryan there, and that the, um, let's say, additional recreation fields, athletic fields uh, that we would need would be on the east side of the property uh, moving forward. This is a zoning map of the same piece of property. Uh, the dark blue is I-1, which is institutional, uh, which is what we want. That's what we are. And then on the east side of the property, we have um, four other zonings that need to be changed to institutional. So we'll be needing to work with the city to get that changed so that we have all the proper zoning prior to needing to develop any of this so that it is all institutional. Is the light blue like the watershed? Because yes. this looks like a really odd zoning map. It's very colorful. Yeah, and it's really swirly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the blue, right, would be um, wetlands. Okay. Light blue. Light blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and the, the city has actually asked us to use part of our property already. Uh, our property on here is outlined in, with white dots, and the city would like to put in a recreational trail, uh, which is the red line that comes straight down and across at the bottom of our property, uh, as well as a uh, trailhead consisting of uh, restroom facilities and parking, which is kind of the blue square at the top there. Uh, the yellow lines are future trails mm -hmm. that the city would like to put in. Uh, so we will be, I'll be meeting with the city engineer to talk about this, uh, <coughs> and we will bring this back to the board uh, for action on whether the board would like to allow the city to do this. Um, I just want to get a little bit more information on what they're thinking uh, and, and what that would take to do that before we, <coughs> we talk about it here. And I have a meeting with them uh, within the next week. I would Go just ahead. one question I will have in a, you know just is do any of our other schools have such close proximity to a publicly traveled trail? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not more a, of a safety concern. Yeah. Yeah. Country yeah. Country deals, huh? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is such a big parcel of land that, and it's so accessible, is there's no way we're going to prevent someone from coming on the property. Um, just, uh, just that's one of my questions. Yep, yep. Yeah. okay. Yeah, I agree. Would we be expected to maintain the trails? Mm -hmm. uh, I would you say no. personally, <laughs> get you one of those sticks for a litter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would think we would ask them to, yeah. uh, to until until we have a school there and and or have fields there, I would expect <coughs> that we would ask the city to maintain them until. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, you're talking about a parking lot, and I didn't realize you know that's right. that's <laughs> something to ask the that's something I'd, I'd have questions about um, with the city. And, and would the city purchase this land or pay a, a fee for use? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to say no, that that will not I, be part of their proposal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have guessed that already. <laughs> but are we going to take any firm stance in that area? Uh, one of the things is it's right along where we would like to develop fields in the future, athletic fields. Mm -hmm. So where they have it placed right along the lot line is a good spot for it. Also on the southern border, if it's right along the lot line, it's out of our way. That's best for us. Um, I did mention to them that for that restroom facility, we don't want this to be like a teeny tiny building right. for people who are just going to walk because we're going to have a lot more people there. I'm thinking this looks more like the restrooms at the high school football field. Yep. So that there's plenty of space, um, they're nice buildings, uh, and we maintain them, uh, and that the parking is appropriate as, as well, because there'll be more use in the future. I'm imagining that environmental regulations wouldn't allow us to do a significant amount with that southern border anyway, given that it is a watershed region. Right. right. So somebody else wants to be responsible for it, perhaps. I, I don't know. 
are the other yellow connecting routes expected to be constructed at the same time, or is it just going to be an isolated route? Uh, since they're listed as future, I'm not sure if it's part of it, but I'll ask that question. Yeah, because when they because the Oakwood doesn't come like that's sort of around 60th that it comes down by the um, mm -hmm. you know what I mean that right. building mm -hmm. yeah. the sports complex. Oakleaf Trail. Right, right. Is the bathroom connected to sewer and water? It would be. It, it would, would be. be. There is yeah. already. They're they, running sewer and water along Old Ryan Road. Mm -hmm. They have uh, they have that at the DPW building there, so it's it's oh, that's right okay. off of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else I uh, should ask the city or take into account? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think the zoning is the mm -hmm. you know getting the zoning done is is going to be a it's going to be a big deal for me. I have more of a theoretical question, and I, this will reveal my lack of knowledge about municipal governance. But um, all of these developers are developing these areas, and then it's it will they will be housing people for Franklin, but then we have to turn around. Can you ever say like, can you give us a little money towards schools? I don't even know what that would look like or what that is, but is there ever a mechanism by which some of that could be addressed up front? There was a mechanism like that. Impact fees. Impact, Impact fees. fees. That's it. Right. Impact fees. When they first began, uh, I was on the committee with the people at the city, and the largest portion of the impact fee was going to go to schools mm -hmm. because it has the biggest impact on schools. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was written up. The plan was written up, and when it went to the state for approval, the state said, "No, there's no impact on schools from people moving in." You can charge for recreation, you can charge for fire, you can charge for parks, anything you want, but not schools. There's really no effect. So that had, that made no sense, uh, but we were out. Was that we, in regards to a specific development or just statutorily impact fees cannot be used to address schools? Uh, in in someone's opinion at the state, that was what it was and it was that held the force of law. I don't know that it's written that way, hmm. but that was that was how it came back uh, because the city was putting that into their ordinances yeah. and they had to take schools out and we didn't get any money out of it. When did, when, I'm just curious, when did that happen? Ballpark? Maybe 1994. <coughs> A while ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Time to call our alder people. <laughs> <laughs> but there are impact fees for recreation still in existence. So when you want to put up that building, there is your money. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> but I think, you know, when the new development comes in and you collect taxes, that is, does help us some, right? Because you're taking care of the students, but also that property pays taxes, which helps us generate revenue. So it's Although we're not getting some upfront impact fee, in the long run, whatever the student comes in, they bring some money with that. It's That's true in terms of ongoing operating expenses, but this would be a significant capital outlay to build a new <coughs> school, and even with what we've put into our capital improvement fund, right. it wouldn't touch it. So, Right. It, it's good that we will get taxes when the houses are in there, but they don't pay for the students coming from those houses. You, you need the taxes from the other businesses that don't send children as well to kind of even that out. So looking at the future, uh, what are we working on? Uh, we're working on these questions. When will we need a new elementary school? How quickly will these subdivisions develop? And would we need to alter Countrydale's boundaries prior to building a new school? Um, so we'll be working on these as well as the, the overall timeline and we will bring that information back to you when we get that together. I th um, if, if memory serves, the other purpose of this update was just wondering um, if there are going to be any, you know, like the money um, re-turfing the fields came out of uh, that fund. So are there any smaller projects that you're, like what is your list of smaller projects for the next year looking like? Uh, 
Yeah, that's in the report next month. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess I can or be patient. Next, or the next meeting. Next yeah. meeting. Next actually. meeting, yeah. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. I just want so you're just at this point accounting for all known development. Right. That list of students is all known. Oh. And when you're trying to answer the question, when will we need a new elementary school, would you play with some scenarios that would kind of answer that question across the range? We'll be able to see what the numbers are just from that chart that would push us into needing another elementary school. Uh, and then we'll also give like how long would it take from having a school to thinking about a referendum, what is that time frame? We'll have that down um, so that you know for planning for the future if we get to this time next year um, and there's three times as many developments or there's three more very large developments with different builders that are going to mm -hmm. take off really quickly, that'll alter the time frame and it, it would move it up. But the tricky thing is we can't be using sort of population growth to model any of our future needs because it seems they're largely being driven by a, a development boom in Franklin. Right. Yes? We have, we've never grown uh, through births here. It's always people moving in mm -hmm. and, and kids coming into the system in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing about a referendum is that people, people don't vote yes because you've done great planning and you know that there's a problem coming. Yeah. The problem has to be here and they have to see it and then they're willing to say, yep, I see the problem, you have it now, let's do something about it. Can you go back to that um, the slide <coughs> with the numbers of students in that one? Um, so according to the numbers we have was approximately 400 new homes in the next five years, mm -hmm. likely, which um, I think we are, are we still using a number of half a, half a kid per, per new home? Uh, oh, across the entire city, it's just under half. Uh, but for these calculations, we looked at the two newest subdivisions that we have operating, mm -hmm. and we used the average number of students that we're getting from those, okay. which uh, is 0.75. Okay, so that's about 300 students, is that, is that right? Yeah, 257. Okay, thank you. Um, these numbers, except for Countrydale, don't look, don't, they don't look dire. Um, I, I realize there's going to be more, there's more usable land to be developed. Um, but these numbers don't look dire, so um, and maybe we don't have this information yet. So when are we, um, you know, when do we think we will need a new school? We're working on it, right? I understand that, but are we talking about 10 years? Or are we talking about? I, I prefer to see the data and let that Agreed. answer the question as opposed to top of your head, how about this year? That's probably a good point, Linda. Are we looking at any of the flow of children mm -hmm. because we have uh, one, two, three, four, five elementary schools flowing into a middle school, then that flows into the high school. And what's the impact of all these additional kids coming in elementary to there big, two years, three yeah. years down the road? There are big bolus in second grade, for example. Yeah. Well, uh, Forest Park Middle School is showing that they have 57 uh, available yeah. at, at the end there. But when we get to the point where the kids start mm -hmm. flowing through, when are we going to blow that school away and need additional? Right. That's that's part of what we're looking at too. It isn't just the elementary schools. It's so that really hasn't been forecast yet, though. Right? Uh, it hasn't been forecast. The middle school population hasn't changed a whole lot in the last ten years, uh, even though our total number of students has gone up. Uh, we do have the ability to add on to the middle school on the second floor. There's another hallway we can add in there with extra rooms. And then beyond that, we would add on to the uh, back uh, part of the building that comes out this way facing um, the parking lot. That can be extended. The gym can be made bigger as well. All of that has been planned out. Um, so we can do that, and that is one of the things we'll look at. But yeah, that's interesting, and, the, and it's probably very difficult to predict 
are people moving into these homes with newborns versus current, you know, right. middle schoolers. Well, you can see on the chart that Franklin High School has got the lowest, I mean, 38. And I'm surprised we have so much capacity at the high school, but not sure how that happened. We have added. Okay. And I, I imagine you will have some experiential advice in terms of the process of having to change elementary school borders. It can be a very emotional mm -hmm. process. So, yeah. Yeah. So right. it's definitely a process. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a process. Um, I, maybe you remember, Mr. Sprague, um, I think the city planner said um, Franklin has about 28% of its um, land that still can be developed. So about a quarter of the, the land uh, within the community. However, there's an awful lot of wetlands in Franklin. So it just gives you an idea of build out, if you will, for this city. Okay. <clears throat> and the city does have a master plan then that kind of 20 years old, I think. Very right? old. Yeah. Not Which, been updated. Yeah. It's not it's not very helpful. Um, even even the subdivisions that, that were on that list, the ones along Ryan, there are two of them almost identical in size. One has 142 homes, one has 87. So and that's a function of how they're building it the size of the lots and the amount of wetlands on the site. So it's... Same zoning? Yes. It's very difficult to, to use anything the city has to figure that out. Um, that's why we're, we're going to be meeting uh, with the planners to go over it and get, get some ideas from them on how they see that developing. Because I don't think the city has any ordinances sort of, li sort of saying minimum lot size or not to be de developed from agricultural use, to the best of my knowledge. Any farmers that wanted to sell off their 40 acres and farmhouses could do it if they wanted. Uh, as far as a maximum that, lot that size? Sounds, that sounds like what Mr. Olson said. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, we had uh, a school site um, off of Oakwood Road oh. a number of years ago. It was on the master plan as a school site. And I went out to look at it. And there's a house right in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a nice house. <laughs> you could imagine kids in it and everything, but uh, the whole place, it was, it was like 40 acres oh was sold to one person and they put their house right in the middle of it. And I went to the city and said, how can this happen? It's on the master plan as a school site. And they said, oh, we don't look at that when somebody's just coming for a single house. We look at that when they're looking at it for a subdivision. Okay. Like, okay. We'll, we'll keep looking. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for this information. What, what, is, um, what is the status of our land on um, the 11 acres that we had um, off of Hyde? Oh, Hyde? Hyde? Mm -hmm. Hyde? <laughs> Where? Where? <coughs> High Street? Was that, is that where that is? High Street. <coughs> off of 76th yeah. Street. Hyde. High Street, High Street. Yeah. Um, oh, it's a, between right. 76 and 84. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we had someone who was interested in purchasing it, and the board voted to uh, sell it if that's what the person wanted, and it turned out that they backed out on that and bought someplace else. <coughs> um, so um, I'm going to talk to the city about that as well to see if they're interested in that parcel uh, and probably get our... Uh, real estate agent on it and get it listed and start um, getting it up for sale so that we can pull in some money from that is the most likely scenario. It's like 11 acres or something if I'm 21. 21. It's in a unique spot though, mm -hmm. kind of tucked in there. It's mm -hmm. a good location for a park. Sounds mm -hmm. like it. Really? You can't really get to it. If you know where it is, from a bike trail. <laughs> secret secret it is. It's from 100 yards from my house. <laughs> no, right, this is very buying. interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we need, do we have anybody have further questions about this or? I'm just wondering if we can, uh, in our board library, create a, a, a place for some of these planning documents for reference purposes. Sure. That's a good idea. Maps and things that we might want to find and reference. I thought that's where I would put this. 
so that it's always there for you to access. I appreciate those numbers. That's more numbers. All right. Thank you. Uh, superintendent search update. Ms. Damers, please. Uh, thank you. So I wanted to come back this evening and just kind of provide an update from the last meeting um, of where we are with the superintendent search. Um, so since our last meeting, we did um, have some more conversations with School Exec Connect, who the board had chosen to partner with for the superintendent search. Um, after some the initial conversation that I went into was kind of discussing what the board had requested. So um, are there some things that the district could do independently? And then the search firm would kind of help us with bits and pieces of the search, mostly taking on um, that big piece of kind of going out and searching for candidates and screening them on our behalf and then providing them to the board. Um, so after some extensive conversations with them, they are willing to do that for us. Um, but they had mentioned that they had some concerns about the integrity of their own process as a business and an organization that does this um, professionally. So we kind of came to a conclusion um, that you know they would be willing to provide this service, but it wouldn't necessarily maintain the integrity of the search as a whole in terms of the guarantees that they would provide us in the event that something would happen with a candidate, whether they would withdraw themselves from the process or for any reason they would not stay with the district for an extended period of time. Um, so the other option that we have is to utilize the search firm for the full course that they had offered in their full proposal. Um, and at this point, the recommendation would be to do that moving forward um, just to get the process initiated and moving. Um, but it would be a uh, not necessarily a higher cost than it would be what was exactly provided in the proposal, um, which I know was the board was looking to see if we could um, remove some of that. But at this point, we would do that full amount that was provided. Thanks for your update and thanks for laying it out so clearly for us. <coughs> I was also reassured by your comment in your email that, you know, working with them was a, a reasonable and good experience. <laughs> Couldn't think of a better adjective, sorry. Uh, and I would echo what Angela is saying and Dr. Beer is saying. I, I would support going with them completely just so we can get the ball rolling and really have a good, a good search. We want the best person that we can possibly get. Agreed. Agreed. I agree. Um, do we need, um, the, since we're spending money on this, do we need to have um, a motion to do this. Um, I know we talked about this, Ms. Domers, but I don't think we do, do we? I don't think so. We haven't done it that way in the past. Um, and then the second piece I just wanted to mention um, and let the board know is that um, to maintain transparency and keep um, obviously employees and the community updated about the search process, um, it's pretty um, standard that a district would create an additional web page or a page on our website just to indicate the superintendent search um, and it, we would kind of provide little updates throughout the process to let the public know. It would also be a really great place to post when we do initiate our survey a link that people can access it very easily as well as the information on when those open forums would be held. So um, I'm going to work with Mr. Kafka on that to get that up and running. Thank you. And oh. that's all part of their standard process, the forums and the survey? Yes. Okay. That's their professional yep. process. How soon do we think this gets started and how like timeline wise? Yeah, so I have indicated urgency on several occasions. Um, so I think that I would connect with them <coughs> as soon as tomorrow um, to get the ball rolling and I can provide you more with an updated timeline as soon as they've had the ability to adjust. They did indicate that um, they would be able to, from their original proposal, move even quicker than was indicated. Um, so that's something I'll provide to you as soon as I have it. Good. I'm excited to get started. Do you have an end date in mind? Uh, the original proposal um, had us starting in January and ending in April. So that may push to the first week of May. Um, that's just my best guess at this point. Thank you. Um, and as we're talking about superintendent now, um, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss um, uh, board policy 4750 um, 
and uh, ask for consensus on um, changing an item uh, for the uh, board administrators uh, or the superintendent evaluation um, to say the school board may choose not to complete the evaluation process in the final year of employment of our superintendent who is retiring from the district. Um, so yeah. that so yeah. that, that, that That's process our wouldn't be. Is that, our current policy? No, it's that, actually administrative rules. So okay. the board doesn't have to take action on it. Okay. Um, so it wouldn't be necessary for any action, but just consensus, I would presume not to complete an evaluation for someone who's not looking for their next job. <laughs> I think that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. I mean, I know we're going to go through the goals and oh and, yeah, I will be. Sort of I'll be talking about my goals at the next. I think then the, the when we present the coherence plan, March I'm going to be talking about the goals okay, that so I've set. Okay, so it's two more meetings. Okay. Yes, so there's yes. a coherence plan. Still, out. still going yeah. to give you feedback on what I've been doing, but the whole formal process seems unnecessary. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So it sounds like everybody feels comfortable with that. Um, we can go to item F, state convention reports. Um, does anyone want to start? <coughs> Otherwise, we'll go in alphabetical mm -hmm. order, Dr. Beer. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I can't remember what I wrote so long ago. Well, I did include an update on the delegate assembly. The um, uh, past resolutions are included as a separate PDF attachment. And uh, I just noted that two significant changes were made to the resolutions as uh, we discussed them. One, we discussed at our previous meeting about the resolution asking for funding for children with disabilities to be based on 90% of the prior year's eligible costs as opposed to 60% in the original language of the draft resolution, and that passed. And the other was um, broadening of staff expenditures eligible for state categorical aid for school mental health services. That was just including school nurses in the list of professionals eligible to receive that aid. Um, I went to a couple interesting, I tried to go to something <laughs> along the theme of communication and com engaging with the community. Um, w the two that I wrote up, um, one was with three um, board members from Southeast Wisconsin districts with very different districts and very different sort of backgrounds individually. And they just shared some practices that were shared amongst all three of their districts that were helpful. And I think some of these could be interesting for us going forward. I was really interested in the idea that they distributed their electronic district mm. newsletter to any community member that wanted it. It was pushed out to any email that requested it. So that's something I'd like to talk to Mr. Kafka about. Um, it is available on the website. It's not confidential material, but people are always more likely to read something that lands in their uh, email. And then just different types of linkage groups, communication groups that they use that we may be able to model uh, going forward. Can I just uh, yep. Um, Were you there too, Linda? I was not, but Mrs. that, that uh, slide deck was shared, though, through SWSA, and there was one piece of that we didn't touch on that I think was kind of enlightening was the, on the website, I think it was, Whitmill has what the board does. They have like a breakdown. You could, um, it would open up and tell for the board, you know, the public on what basic questions that they might have about board operations. Mm -hmm. And it's. You know, we could steal it, I guess, or copy it, or be, absolutely, it'd be yeah. easy. We add. saw Whitnell's just up the road. I'm sure we could yeah. even ask them <laughs> take some coffee, and that's what we can do. We've talked about that before, having some better communication about the role of the board and what. Right, I think I shared it with most of you. So if we could, I don't know how we get that rolling or how we decide to, to go forward with that, but I thought that was quite valuable, easy to implement, and probably needed. Well, it sounds like those are both things that might be in a good. Um, Kafka Convo re-communication. So, um, and then another I did was just about um, implementing high quality curricula and it was with the school district from Stoughton whose uh, superintendent is also in his last year of employment. He's gonna be retiring. And honestly, this turned into a conversation about developing a, a culture of um, humility, willingness to admit mistakes and willingness to change. So it was honestly just a really interesting um, sort of cultural examination of how they uh, how they did things there. So, um, oh, good. I enjoyed my first uh, conference. That is all. Thank you, Mrs. Zafirsky, <laughs> please. Um, I overlapped with a couple <coughs> of Dr. Beer's um, sessions, so I won't get into that. Uh, but it was, I, I thought it was exciting. It was better for me than it was last year, which was virtual. I, it was nice to be in person. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought the convention did a really good job with their health and safety protocols and things like that. 
Um, and just kind of exciting to see how many people are involved in school board and to hear from so many different people um, and learn different, you know, just everybody's different approaches. Um, one of the sessions that I went to, I um, was talking about uh, how to attract and retain staff. And um, using, in, in this case, it was a very, a rather small district that uses a performance-based compensation model, which has its own challenges. But it just was interesting to see a district really focus on that and realize that they had a problem, that they had a lot of staff, you know, coming and leaving right away, and they really wanted to attract the best and keep them. So that was just kind of an interesting um, session to sit through. And then um, a lot of the communication ones, like Dr. Beer said, it was just nice to hear some different ideas, some of the things that we've talked about and kind of get some implementation kind of strategies. Um, I thought there, the one on the first day that I was there, Wednesday, there was the myths about learning, which I think oh, Mike was yeah. there, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and that was just interesting because you think that you know a lot about schools, right? We all went to school and we know what it means for, to learn, but it was just, that one kind of turned into a little bit of a conversation too, just about those kind of long held beliefs and really how they're, not, not that they're wrong, but just, they're kind of wrong. <laughs> Maybe they are wrong. Maybe they are. You know, yeah. just, I mean, I, um, like the examples I put here, like fast learning is good learning. Like if we can get through this curriculum, pacing guys, we're going to do this. You know, this is how we learn. No, that's not good. Like it's better to, to struggle and better to spend some time on things and, and really understand the learning than to just zip through it. And, you know, it says we have to get through four pages today, so we're going to get through four pages today. Like that was, that was interesting. Or um, class sizes, you know, I, something I've been real involved in for a long time, right? Class size, and it's not necessarily, you know, a very small class is gonna lead to better learning, but the importance of balancing a class size with also the needs in the, in the room and also the really quality instruction, and all of those pieces go together for good learning. So it just, it was really interesting to kind of sit and talk, and then here, like I said, it became more of a conversation, a lot of different people in the room sharing their different ideas about that, so. And as long as we're on that one, yeah. there was one I just thought was a valuable was that, you know, school should be about learning, not grades. And one point they made was that growth is a better measure of effectiveness rather than achievement. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that the recent uh, uh, action at the state level is they want to change the report card to, they want to go more achievement as opposed to growth. And really, we were at the conference, and really, growth is probably more important mm -hmm. than achievement. So one of those myths that right, probably it's just another persists. myth that yeah, persists. you think getting that 4.0 is the most important thing, but not maybe not necessarily, right? Right. So um, Thursdays we started off with the um, the future economy, what school leaders need to know, which was the session that Dr. Miller presented at, which was. I thought it was a real moment of like Franklin pride because here was the opportunity to show what Franklin has done with getting our students involved in um, apprenticeships, ed <laughs> education for employment and apprenticeships, internships and things like that in the community and building those community relationships and um, it was it was just really nice to see that Franklin was highlighted and um, to see that the work that we're doing is being recognized and you know other districts are doing the same so um, I, you know um, what was interesting about it is you know there's a wealth of information about what the, the um, job market is going to need that data and what the future the data is is really really good and to not look at it is a mistake mm -hmm. as we move forward mm -hmm. with providing opportunities for our kids. So I was really impressed with that. Yeah. It's maybe our parents need to see that data more. So. Yeah. Well, and it was, it was, I mean, we all went to that one, uh, of course, to support Dr. Miller, but, um, <laughs> but I also was very interesting and um, I thought informative. And, you know, as I was talking with um, Mr. Schultz today from Crohn's, mm -hmm. and, um, it, it's, People like um, people like him and people like that gentleman from Luxembourg um, mm -hmm. uh, in that school district, the manufacturers that are really putting back into schools, um, it's it's really valuable to our to our school community and um, our economy. And, it's a you know draw a bigger circle. It's everybody benefits. Right, and he's he's anxious to he's anxious to to have the um, to have Franklin <coughs> schools be more. Um, have more opportunities um, in the business park. So, um, so anyway, I thought that was I, I thought that was a good session, um, and also a lot of I thought a lot of similar 
things happened in the in the first keynote um, um, with uh, Robbie uh, Huthising, um, who was kind of an interesting guy and spoke. Yeah. Um, um, he was uh, um, his grandparents were um, uh, Nehru um, from India and um, uh, the prime the former prime Gandhi yeah, Indira Gandhi, um, Indira was, Gandhi his, like, his was, his, was his relative of his yeah. anyway um, his he came from a a group of um, real educated people um, he decided not to go to college he went to um, he became a musician um, and uh, was very successful um, it had a very um, very meteoric rise to the top and um, and it was I think we call it an ice pick graph because it went immediately back down. They had, uh, he was a member of the band Hanson, which um, <laughs> was in my time a little bit. But uh, um, but they had one hit, one one hit album and, and went back down. But anyway, he went on to do different things and, and he keeps pivoting as, um, he keeps pivoting and doing different things as time goes on and, and continues to grow. And uh, he's, been as successful as the rest of his family and now is really into the education field and and um and building schools around the world so um i, I fortunately got a chance to speak with him for a little while as i saw him by the um uh by the art exhibits and uh nice guy so um so that was that was one of the sessions that i i really got a lot out of um also the the legislative update um which um, I, I think we went over um, last last meeting was the exact same um, handout, but yeah. I put it I put the handout in the um, uh, in in with my notes, um, and I'm not sure we have to go over it again. But I thought that was um, a lot of times those things can be kind of dry, but this guy was uh, the guy was better than most people at giving one of these um, mm -hmm. giving one of these seminars. So. Um, I got a lot out of that as well, and I agree with you, um, Mrs. Sapersky. It's having, have, being there is so much is so much better, uh, so much better experience than, <coughs> than doing it online. Do we get to cover all of yours, Anne? Or did you Pardon? Did we cover all of yours, or did you? Yes. Yeah, we're okay. good. There's a lot of overlap. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I did kind of cover things that I hopped around on. I liked a variety of things. Um, I did, um, they always have these smaller sessions, I don't know if you caught that, but in the exhibit hall they had spaces where they talked about technology and one was about space, the learning spaces. And it, it seems to me like there's a lot at the state level that they're doing as far as technology. And I did pick up some papers and I'll, okay. I'll share those with you. And then also on the learning spaces side, they, it was interesting how some of the projects around the state where they, um, they put these labs next to the cafeterias and things so that there's more access so students can see what's happening in the um, the STEM lab or the mm. culinary arts lab or things like that. It helps make connections. Um, talked about the myths for learning. Um, there was a data management session that I know Ms. Cody was at, which was fascinating. It was by the Elmbert School District and what they were able to do is kind of pull together their student data so that they can <coughs> I think we might be doing this as part of that program, but you could find you know, what's going on at the building level, drill down to the classroom, and then find the student that needs help. And it's all done through bringing these data systems together. And there's obviously firms out there that are interested in helping you do that. <laughs> um, also, um, I wanted to mention that um, one of the, they, Elmbert also had a session, and I think you were at that, Angie, where they had a student representative at school yeah. board meetings, which I thought was quite powerful. I agree. And mm -hmm. something, I know we, I hate to say, but we did try that here, but couldn't sustain it. Um, but they, you know, they worked there, they do it a little bit differently, and I think it's something maybe we should also think about doing, maybe checking with our high school. Yeah, they had a very um, sort of, standardized, codified way that the students sought information on a specific question from their peers in leadership positions at the school, came, gave a report on that, fielded questions, and then were excused from the remainder of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So I think that's key. And those questions actually came from administration. They were the one that kind of 
for the year gave them a set of questions of what they wanted to know about the culture or other things yeah. at the high school. So if we ever wanted to do it, I think there were some good take homes there. And then the last one I, I went to was on a, a tobacco end game. I was, you know, it's about vaping. I wasn't going to go to that one, but I was sitting next to a school board member. She was in the northern, uh, northern part of, this, of the uh, state. This is some other session. And she mentioned that they were doing, you know, during, she had a lot of expulsion hearings related to, to kids that were vaping. I thought, wow, that doesn't seem like the best way to deal with that. So that there, well, there was a whole session on what to do, how we can approach vaping in a more productive way. And I did pick up the, uh, and there's also, um, obviously that there's a lot of tobacco money out there and there's you know an agency that's already put this program together that we can just tap into if you're interested in looking into that. And, and Angie, didn't you enjoy Craig Council at the end? Oh, I did, didn't you? Such a... He was so engaging and the way that they ran that session, um, it reminded me of, do you remember inside the actor's studio with Alan Lipton? Yep. He, how he'd just sit up on stage and ask questions of someone and have this conversation, but it was less cringy. I always found Alan Lipton to be a little bit <laughs> awkward, but um, just what a natural storyteller. Right. And he did connect, you know, teaching and coaching, you know, help, helping someone to perform at their best. Mm -hmm. You need to have diversity of decision makers at the table. That kind of surprised me that he's bringing more women mm -hmm. into his uh, yep. um, thinking. And then even he's got to deal with cultural and language differences, yep. which you don't always think about. But so it was, um, it was a great way to end the conference. It was. So and I thought it was thing. And wasn't the music performances always oh, amazing? Grand? Fantastic. <clears throat> they always are. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you everyone. Um, uh, item 11, school board liaison reports. Anybody have any board liaison reports? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Go ahead. I did, um, we did have an SWSA meeting and it was a little technology challenge for me, but Judy came and helped me out. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't. <laughs> and uh, lots, of, lots of good stuff coming and I think we have that as a specific agenda item next, yep. next mm -hmm. time. But um, some interesting things coming uh, down the pike. Um, have you been aware of the parents' rights, parental rights bill that's kind of been kind of introduced? Mm -hmm. So give some thought to what you think about that. Um, there's also the possibility of some kind of asking for additional funding because there's a huge opportunity given the surplus at the state budget level that we there might be an opportunity to. Um, engage legislature in addressing that. So those are some big items and I think we'll cover that more in a more organized fashion next next meeting. That's all I have. That's it. I had a um, meeting uh, at CESA or uh, fortunately it was um, virtual this time, but um, uh, Dr. Gavigan, who's the executive director of CESA is also resigning or retiring. Um, and so uh, we are going through a similar process um, uh, at CESA. Um, so uh, although this one includes several extra meetings, so um, <laughs> I think we're doing a lot of the interviewing candidates ourselves and that sort of thing. So um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of interviews this spring, it seems like. <laughs> mm -hmm. You'll be good at it. You'll be very end. good, yeah. Um, I had a Franklin Education Foundation meeting last week, I guess it was. Um, and we already talked about our Valentine's Day uh, fundraiser and that has been a huge success. Um, mm -hmm. All of our staff members will be getting Valentine's and it's a really great opportunity to recognize them. Um, we also, the <coughs> kind of the purpose of the meeting, it was our first one that I've been to that's been in person. We gathered together to kind of do a little strategy session and kind of thinking, kind of planning ahead for the Franklin Foundation. <coughs> how can we continue to support the district and like what, what you know, kind of looking at goals and things like that. So it was good. It was nice to be in the same room with people um, and um, some good planning there. We do have our consignment sale coming up, the spring consignment coming up um, April 2nd. And then just for you who might be interested, the golf outing is June 17th, Friday, June 17th. So clear your calendars and get ready to golf. Yeah, I was going to say I, um, I did get asked to be on the golf committee again this year. <laughs> Educational Foundation. So. Um, what day is that again? June 17th. Friday, June 17th. Friday, Friday, June 17th in the morning. At um, Oakwood again like it was last year. That's just half a day? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's well, lunch, it's is, the, lunch, lunch is the final. Is the end? Yeah. Oh. Be done by two. Okay. Two -ish. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Uh, school and community engagement reports. 
I, I was <coughs> able to uh, check in at the high school <coughs> this week, and it was the end of the, se end of the semester two weeks ago, so they're on their next semester, so there was some professional development days that took place, and they're focusing on teams and individual goals, kind of reviewing what happened in the uh, last semester and how they can improve going forward. The theme is, you know, our <coughs> students, these students this year. So what can they do to impact the rest of, of, rest of the year? Um, did get the chance to pop in a couple of classes um, <coughs> in art class and um, uh, history class was the French Revolution. These kids were not exactly engaged, <laughs> but it was, I kept thinking to myself, would I have been engaged in, in that? But um, well, what time of day was that? You know, and then also, it was, you know, between one and two. Oh, well, and I, I don't know what I to just, say then. He said this was the last hour. And I went, wow, is this the last <laughs> hour? I'm yeah. just kind of getting going here. Oh, boy. But the school, it's such a organized, everything just happens. You know, it's a quiet atmosphere. Everybody's focused. It's not the high school I remember, but it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the kids. It's just a uh, seems like a focused, you know, group. So I'll say that that was my visit. Thank you. Anyone else? It's kind of a slow couple weeks. I went to a basketball game uh, last week, Friday night, and that was kind of fun. <coughs> I haven't been to a basketball game yet, so this year, so it was, that was fun. Girls basketball, they were winning. The stands were really crowded. I was actually really impressed with how many people were there. It was fun. It's nice to be getting out again. People are feeling better. Uh, item 12, school board meeting debriefing. Anybody have any comments? I think it was so great to hear the school nurses being awarded you know, a yeah. national or a statewide award and our business owner speaking. Yeah, that was great. All plus mm -hmm. positive things. So. And I'm also wondering if, did anyone see the Chamber Awards uh, request to attend? Not everybody got that? Yeah, I think it's on 24th, right? Next week? Not next week, it's last week. Um, <laughs> it's out there, yeah. It's a couple. Yeah. Is everybody, anybody going? I'm just wondering. I am. <coughs> okay, Excuse only me. one time. Okay. Please make sure you let Ms. Sosha. Okay. okay, all right. <laughs> it's coming up, though, right? Yes, uh, the deadline to register is next week, Wednesday. So I was going to send an email all right thank you future agenda items uh, Countrydale Elementary School presentation <coughs> academic excellence scholarship recipient approvals technical excellence scholarship recipient approvals those are always great days buildings and grounds annual report SWSA updates uh, and then uh, Pleasant View will be the, the um, first meeting in March. Um, coherence plan update, district administrator goals update, um, early college credit and start college now request approvals and summer school course approvals. All right, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The meeting is adjourned at 7.58.